Uh, thank you to the DFI, the organizing committee, and the, and the DFI itself. I know what uh, effort, level of effort and work it takes to put these things on. It's been great so far. Uh, and I'm really grateful for the opportunity to, to share the stage today with, with everybody. Uh, I'd also like to thank uh, Matthew Meyer for his wonderful presentation this morning. Uh, he said that they did uh, rely on the contribution of both side and bass resistance in their rock sockets for the Mercedes Benz. That was music to my ears. Uh, uh, a great segue for what I intend to, to talk about today. Uh, today I will be speaking about the com combination of bass resistance and side resistance in rock sockets. And, uh, you know, the fact that you're sitting in this room and you're here in attendance means I'm probably preaching to the choir. Um, but despite that, there are, uh, you know, despite most codes allowing the contribution of both, despite most up-to-date design guidances recommending the use of both, uh, we, we still see lots of projects that, that choose to not take advantage of the tremendous benefit that can be gained by relying on both contributions of side and base resistance. In particular with, the, uh, with base resistance, you know, it's a base resistance is a function of the diameter squared. And so as drill shafts have, have evolved and gotten bigger in diameter, capabilities have in, improved with the equipment and installation. Uh, that function squared, that exponential relationship means that if you choose to neglect base resistance in a rock socket, you might be giving up thousands or even tens of thousands of kips, uh, which is, is real money. And so I think we can do better. So ultimately, uh, the, the intent of this effort was to uh, dispel the, the seemingly prevalent misconception that side resistance and base resistance in rock sockets don't uh, mobilize at compatible displacements. Okay, so in addition to the, uh, the drilled shaft, DFI drilled shaft committee, I'd like to acknowledge the co-authors, Dr. John Turner and Dr. Ben Turner are colleagues of mine at Dan Brown and Associates. Uh, my buddy Scott Jacobs with Keller, he's around here somewhere, he's, with, he's in Philly. Uh, Kirk McIntosh, who recently uh, busted his ankle up hiking at uh, Moab. Uh, he might be hobbling around somewhere. If not, he's in uh, Jacksonville. He's with Terracon. Uh, Bernardo was uh, helpful with his international perspective. Uh, at, at H. Solis, he's in uh, Costa Rica. The late, great Bernie Hurtline with, uh, with GEI of, of, in Chicago, and then Dr. Jesus Gomez, also with GEI, uh, but in Philly. Okay, so... What I'm going to present today was recently published in the DFI Journal at the end of 2022. Uh, there's also a standalone document the DFI has produced that's available to all of you. And, and really the, the purpose of that document is, is a simple document, a simple tool to help convince owners, clients, contractors, designers uh, of the merits of, of what we're proposing here. So that document is available. I'll note that it's a consensus document. So what that means is uh, as far as the four levels of publication that DFI has, it's the most rigorous. Um, so af after it got through the, the DFI technical committee, we, you know, we tiptoed th tip through that uh, den of pit vipers. We got the document to the DFI's technical review. Okay, we tiptoed through that landmine. And then this document went to the entire membership of DFI so that we could put the entire weight, once we got all the uh, I's dotted and T's crossed so that we could put the entire weight of the DFI in, uh, organization behind it. So a consensus document should pull some weight. So if you need a tool to convince people, we, this, that's the whole point of this document. This document is not intended to be a detailed uh, instruction manual for design or for interpretation of load tests. It's not intended to be a manual that tells you what level of uh, site characterization is required or uh, the proper methods for QA and QC verification or inspection, if you will. It is intended to be a synopsis that encourages practitioners that an adequate or an appropriate body of evidence exists from bi-directional load testing uh, that confirms that if you have proper design, proper construction, proper verification, that side resistance and base resistance in rock sockets does mobilize at compatible displacements. Uh, so we, we're looking to dispel that, that myth. So how we got there, you know, we've learned a lot as an industry in 30 years. In the late 80s, early 90s, uh, O-Cell, the load test was, was, was developing the O-Cell. Uh, and really, it gave us an opportunity to test rock socketed drill shafts in, in axial, from an axial perspective to, to, to loads that we could never th were never possible before. Dr. Main in his uh, Osterberg lecture this morning, uh, he, he quoted 10,000 tons. Well, this load test that you're seeing on the screen now from St. Louis, we mobilized 36,000 tons, 36,000 tons at the time of world record load test. Uh, and you can see with the butterfly chart or the butterfly graph there, we were nowhere near 
uh, the strength limit state in either side resistance or base resistance, but both of them were mobilizing immediately. Uh, you know, my, some might think that this is only a proof test and we left capacity on the table. Well, that's not really true because these, by demonstrating the, the tremendous axial resistance, basically these rock sockets were governed by lateral concerns. Diameter and length of rock socket were both governed by lateral uh, considerations given the tremendous axial resistance. So really the, the advent of bi-directional testing and what it's done for rock socket design and construction uh, in the last 30 years has really moved the ball. In addition, we, we're way better now at characterizing the site if we choose to do so. Um, there's really no more excuses for we don't know what's under the ground. We're designing in the geo environment. We, there's really no excuse for, for us not knowing what's out there. We have the tools. We just now need to, need to spend the money to, to, to take a proper look. Uh, we've always had rock coring, uh, but now I think the quality of rock coring and the presentation of the results is a lot better. In, in addition to just having a, a boring log, now we get detailed photos, high quality photos, RQD and recovery are, are routinely, routinely uh, reported, uh, so it makes it, it, it makes it a lot nicer to, to, to design. In addition, in those same core holes, now we have acoustic, acoustic televiewers, ATV, or optical televiewers, OTV. So if you core rock and you, you measure really low RQDs, a lot of times in situ, that rock looks pretty darn good, and that has been proven time and time again with, with the rock socket load tests. Uniaxial compressive strength tests, uh, you know, it's a simple test. I don't know why we don't do them more frequently. They're in the scheme of things, to John's point about load testing with a, little few, a few more instruments, they're relatively cheap. Uh, and, and when you look at this uh, figure of uniaxial compressive strength with depth, there's a wide range of variabilities. So that all goes into the design. And so uh, having more unconfined tests, it's, it's simple, I, I believe. Geophysics has come a long way, especially when it's truth with the boring. Uh, so if we have conditions of karstic, or if we have concerns of karstic uh, conditions, geophysical uh, methods have come a long way to help us understand the subsurface. And then slake durability, okay? When, I'll get into it a little bit later with construction methods, but now we have tests where if we're, we're concerned about degradation of weak rock, the sidewalls of say a shale or, or even a weak sandstone, uh, we can run these slake durability tests with the medium of water, which is typical, or even with polymer slurry to see that we see uh, we can measure uh, preservation of sidewall or the material if we're concerned about it. Construction has gotten better. Drilled shafts are nothing new, but I think we've gotten, we've gotten better at it. We now use, routinely use airlifts or other means to, to provide the suction at the base of the shaft to get the shafts clean. I will say that's not only important for counting on base resistance, contractors in the room, that also helps you reduce uh, potential for anomalies at the base. If we have a dirty bottom, and we, at the onset of the trim replacement of concrete, uh, it displaces all that sediment that's at the bottom. That gets pushed to the side of the drilled shaft where the cage is, and that's also where our non-destructive testing uh, instruments are. So we see uh, if you clean the shafts, you, you have a, a much better chance of, of avoiding anomalies. Uh, polymer slurry has been used, that's in the center photo there. Uh, we've found that it does help preserve the integrity of, of questionable rock uh, if you're worried about loss of uh, resistance due to environmental effects. And then that photo on the far right, that's just, you know, now we know when we're working in, say, artesian conditions like this one was, uh, if we keep a positive head, if we do things right from a construction perspective, uh, we're confident that we can get the resistance we're planning on. We've got a lot more tools, okay? I, the, the old uh, mindset that uh, I can't inspect a shaft underwater or under slurry. I don't know what's going on in the dark. I want to put my eyeballs on it. We've got tools today that we can, we can confidently say the shaft is what, it, what it's supposed to be. Uh, anywhere from the mini SID device there on the left, uh, the sonic caliper that's uh, operated by load test, Fugro load test there, and also PDI's equipment. They've, they've done a, a tremendous job moving the ball forward with their shape uh, and their squid devices. So the, the devices exist to be able to, underwater, under slurry, still uh, confirm cleanliness and, and quality of, of rock socket design, uh, construction. Okay, so as, as the task force got together, we said, okay, what codes are out there? And, we, and first of all, we know that there are virtually hundreds, maybe thousands of local municipality codes, but these are the big ones that we looked at. ARIMA, so you folks that deal with railroads, uh, the contribution of side and base resistance in a rock socket is allowed. IBC 2021 is perfect. It says, yeah, it's allowed. You can count on both of them if you've got the adequate subsurface investigation. Perfect. That's what we should all endeavor to have. ACI is a little more silent on the issue, both their design spec and construction spec. 
There is some limited guidance in the construction spec, uh, but that's not really a design guidance. I will also say that uh, ACI 336, uh, Rudy Frizzy tells me, and Scott Jacobs both tell me that that's uh, currently uh, going, uh, undergoing an update. So maybe there's changes to that one coming. The most inclusive is probably the Ashto design code. Um, but there is some contradictory language in the, in the Ashto code. Really, that contradictory language is in the commentary, which is not intended to be code, uh, but oftentimes uh, it is interpreted to be code. So there, there's a little uh, uh, debate on, on what's allowed in, in Ashto or not. I think it's pretty clear, but I've lost that argument before. So despite these codes and the allowance of, of, of trying to optimize, a lot of engineers or practitioners still don't do it. And why? because this notion of displacement incompatibility or sometimes called strain incompatibility or compatibility. And really I think the, all the bi-directional, the body of evidence with the bi-directional load tests, when done properly, they dispel this, this uh, notion. The possibility of strain softening behavior of the sidewall. So if it takes us a little bit longer to mobilize the full base resistance, if the side resistance isn't dropping off at a limit state, it doesn't matter. Uh, and really the, the overwhelming majority of load test results we have in rock sockets, we do not see brittle behavior, brittle response of the sidewall. Possibility of degradation of the material, again, I think with proper construction techniques and some of the advancements in drilling fluid, we can wash that one away. Uncertainty of the sidewall, there are tools, we can make the sidewalls as rough as we want them. And then the old one that uh, the size, you know, the way the, the industry has grown with equipment, that it's outpaced our ability to inspect, that's no longer the case with the, with the tools I showed a few slides ago. Ultimately, I think it's just a lack of confidence in the design. Uh, I put question mark by it because uh, how can we have a lack of confidence in our design? I think that stems from if we don't really know what's in the subsurface. If we let architects tell us how to uh, characterize the ground, if we race to the bottom uh, in that form, uh, then there is question of lack of confidence in the design. I think we can do better, we need to do better. Uh, construction. So if you're a designer and say, well, I don't, I don't have any confidence the contractor's going to clean the hole. Well, get out there and verify it. Uh, th there are ways around it. I, I, don't, I don't think we should blame the contractors in that way. And the inspection verification. How do I know it's going to be clean? We have the tools. Uh, just start using them. Okay, I'm going to do a brief example. This is for a job in St. Louis uh, where, we, where I can show you, where I can put money to the benefit of counting on side plus base resistance. The lower left picture is a plan view of one of the tower foundations. Uh, that was the baseline design. The upper right, same plan view, same tower. Uh, and so and there were two, two main towers on this, this huge cable stayed bridge. Uh, but that was from an ATC, alternative technical concept uh, to revise the foundation design. All right, in this example, I said the baseline only relied on side resistance in the rock sockets, no load test. The ATC design included both side and base resistance. We also had a load test would help, which helped because we took advantage of an increased resistance factor. So maybe not perfectly apples to apples, but still pretty close. So at each tower, we went from 14 shafts to six shafts. We went from nine and a half foot diameter rock sockets to 11 foot. So our diameter got a little bit bigger, but the length of the socket went from 44 feet to 19 feet, okay? It's in St. Louis, excited by the New Madrid fault line. Uh, so we, you, if you think of the seismic excitation and the inertial demands, the smaller we can make the coffer cell, the smaller we can make the cap, that means the less mass. Less mass means a lot less inertial demand on the foundations. And so by making the shafts, the footprint smaller, the cap smaller, the coffer dam smaller, the demands also go down dramatically be, because of a, a less inertial demand. So making the cap smaller and the, and the seal smaller is a big deal. So I won't read you all of the uh, improvements, 42% smaller, 57, I'll let you guys read all that. At the end of the day, by doing a full scale load test on a sacrificial drilled shaft, by counting, relying on side resistance and base resistance, basically lateral controlled the foundation design. Okay, so seismic and vessel collision with scour. At the end of the day, that's 10 million bucks or so of savings. That's enough, that's enough to matter. Even on a project of this magnitude, that's a couple hundred million bucks, $10 million is enough to, to do a little more investigation. Okay, uh, so how do we start? Well, we, we started, uh, we look at these butterfly, butterfly graphs that, are, uh, that come out of a bi-directional load test. This one's from Four River Bridge in Massachusetts. And basically what you're looking at, the, the upward butterfly wing is the mobilization of resistance uh, for everything above the bi-directional cells. So that's the side resistance uh, above the cells. 
And then the bottom part, the bottom wing of the butterfly graph is the side resistance possibly and the base resistance beneath the cells, depending on if the cells at the bottom or not. And I think one thing you'll notice right away is uh, on this particular project where the, where the cell was, was placed almost optimally because we get, uh, we're seeing a very similar response both up and down, the base resistance begins to mobilize immediately. I mean, at very small displacements, right above zero, we're, we're gaining sizable base resistance. Totally compatible base resistance are being mobilized. I mean, in both cases, you're at about a quarter inch and you're well over uh, 14,000 kips in both directions. So 28,000 kips. Uh, and you've, we haven't hardly, hard, hadn't hardly moved the shaft. As is typical with load testing in rock sockets, the strength limit states are hardly ever attained. If they are attained, it's usually an uplift um, where the, shaft, the champagne cork gets popped out of the ground. Uh, to, to counteract that, I think you're all familiar with the, what's called the kind of the Chicago method. Basically, we reduce the, the footprint of the base so that we're concentrating the load to in, increase the unit resistance values at the base, still reacting against the full side of the circumference. There are some limits on what we can do there, um, but it's a, a useful tool to, to really demonstrate and to balance the load. At the end of the day, take away this. Displacements for, for shafts that are properly designed, constructed, and inspected in rock, the displacements, both side and base resistance, are well within the tolerance of most, if not all, civil engineering structures. That's the key takeaway. Okay, so that, that mindset is supported by bidirectional load test results. And so what you see here is a figure, and there are two figures like this in the document. Uh, basically, this is just the loading portion of the butterfly curve for different load tests in different sites around the nation. We only included a portion for illustrative purposes. It's already a pretty, pretty busy chart, and this is not supposed to be a, a database of load test results. We looked at a broad range of bedrock types, sedimentary, igneous, metamorphic, all types of bedrock uh, were considered. A broad range of diameters, anywhere from three feet all the way up to eight and a half feet and, and 11 foot diameter drilled shafts were looked at in this study. And we looked regionally. We looked from New Jersey to California to Minnesota to Florida, all, all across the nation. Uh, and we saw, we, we've seen the, the same consistent uh, response and behavior for, for um, appropriately constructed shafts. Now, what's inappropriate? So, this sometimes referred to as dirty diaper or soft bottom response. If you have a bi-directional load test, and for this particular one, the cell was a little bit off the bottom of the socket, and so as the cell was being expanded or loaded, the cells, uh, the side resistance beneath the, beneath the um, bi-directional device took up most load until it couldn't take it anymore. And then there's where you see that plunging amount, that one inch of, of, of plunge. But when we dug into this, uh, it was a result of construction and inspection rather than performance of the, of the rock. In fact, when we started it looking in the drilled shaft committee and looking in the in industry or the membership wide, we aggressively sought behavior, proof of behavior that disproves our position. And we didn't find any. We couldn't find any. Any, any project, any butterfly graph that we found like this, there was a logical, rational engineering reason of, of the performance. Uh, and so we aggressively sought something different than that, and we, couldn't, we just couldn't find it. All the ones we did find, again, were indicative of, of improper techniques, whether it be clean out, inspection, whatnot. Now, this is appropriate for most cases, okay? Counting on side and base resistance should, should be the rule, not the exception, but exceptions do exist. For instance, if there's karstic conditions or uh, in this particular case you see on the screen, this is for the Franciscan Melange out in San Francisco. The same job site, three different load tests, considerably different uh, mobilized base resistance. So caution is warranted where there's highly, if there's highly variable uh, rock. Um, extreme spatial variability is, is in the case of this. But just because caution is warranted doesn't mean uh, base resistance should be ignored. Even at 82 KSF, I think when you talk about the, the size uh, sockets we're dealing with these days, that could still be several thousand kips of resistance that it's just not worth giving up. Like I said earlier, karst or other solu soluble bedrock conditions, certainly um, you know, caution is warranted in those conditions, but that's where it comes back to doing an adequate subsurface investigation. The level, what defines adequate is dependent on what's there. Okay, so if you got karstic conditions, maybe you gotta do a little bit more. Some of the uh, clay-rich shales, can, uh, maybe there's some caution there, but again, I really think we can handle that with, with proper construction. 
And, you know, if it, we got the tools today. All of these things that require caution, we have the tools to address them at the design phase. It doesn't have to wait till the construction. Uh, so I think we have, we have it in the toolbox to go out and find these things before we get too far down the road. All right, the takeaway, I think we as an industry, that's engineers, owners, contractors, we can do better. We got the tools, we should do better. Why wouldn't we? Uh, the reason we need to do it for clients, and so that's for either owners or contractors, depending on what the procurement method is or what your particular role is. Taxpayers for public infrastructure. I mean, if we're wasting millions of dollars, we, we ought to have some consideration for the poor taxpayer. And planet Earth, like it or not, believe it or not, uh, green is coming if it's not already here. And so we should be doing a better job to optimize foundations and, and consider reducing waste. You can reduce waste by designing things appropriately. All right, so in summary, I'll let you read it. But it, at the end of the day, what the task force and the cons consensus documents uh, trying to implore is that for properly designed, inspected, constructed rock sockets, we should absolutely be considering the combination of both side and base resistance, and they are both, um, they, they both mobilize at compatible displacements. So the notion of having to get to 4% of diameter before you can count on base resistance, that's just not supported by the body of evidence we have with, with bidirectional load test results. You gotta have proper site investigation. Use all the tools in the toolbox. Gotta have proper design. That means not just geotechnical design, but we gotta think as geostructural the right rebar cage, the right concrete mix, so that there's a lot that goes into the design, and if we wanna, we wanna take advantage of the benefits, we have to do, it right, do all four of these steps right. Proper construction techniques. Clean the shaft. It doesn't only allow you to count on sizable base resistance, it reduces your potential for encountering anomalies. And then proper verification. We have the tools. God forbid you get out of the office and go verify it yourself. It's my favorite thing to do, by the way. Um, we have the tools, and if, if you're willing to, to do it, uh, we, can, we can properly verify that cleanliness exists. So thanks, everybody, for your time and attention. And right now, I'll uh, go ahead and uh, try and field any questions anybody may have. You, you stunted us with your brilliance, so. <laughs> any questions? Oh, there's one. Uh, great presentation, Paul. I Thank you. It. Um, excuse my ignorance. I'm, I'm familiar with like muck buckets and stuff to clean out the bottom of shafts. I think you mentioned kind of a, an air injection or extraction yeah, method. It's a, Could you explain that? Bit? Sure. It's called an airlift, and basically it's uh, imagine a hollow, hollow pipe with a 90 degree bend at the top, and you introduce pressurized air from a compressor at the bottom. So you have a hose running down the OD of the pipe, and it's got an inlet right above the tip of the pipe. And so by introducing pressurized air, it creates a venturi effect, which basically is a vacuum. So those bubbles want to get up and out through that pipe as quick as they can. So it creates a vacuum. So basically it's just a big vacuum cleaner. You move around the base of the shaft to get rid of all the soft material. It shoots, it gets more efficient with depth. I mean, if you, the biggest concern is the environment because it's real, it can really shoot stuff out. Okay, thanks. Great presentation, Paul. Uh, this presentation focused on rock socketed drilled shafts. What would your advice be to someone designing drilled shafts that were end bearing on, say, a, a dense sand or a, a stiff clay? Wonderful question, Dan. I, I, I would I'd love to say that you were a plant, but you're not. Uh, uh, th that's the next thing that the DFI Drilled Shaft Committee plans to look look into. It's something very similar to this, but for for shafts bearing in soil. I believe, and, and I know from load test experience in, in sand the base resistance is available in sand in addition to side resistance. And uh, there might be a reason, there might be an economical reason not to count on it, um, but I know that it is available if done right, and I think that's the, gonna be the next endeavor that our committee takes on. Thank you. Well, always good to hear these kind of stories, and I love seeing projects where you can show that you saved $10 million with an ATC. Um, earlier this morning, there was a question about, you know, what does the testing cost? You know, the, the fees charged by the load test provider are just one element of it. You've got a dedicated uh, test shaft that you have to build. You've got a second mobilization for the rig. You probably got more inspection and verification. So using that as an example, could you give an idea of what uh, the kind of input costs were to enable that ATC that saved $10 million? Sure, and I'll just say that 10 million bucks includes the cost. That already accounts for the cost of that. So it's a it, it, your answer of earlier to being zero cost, I think that's, that's a true statement. Uh, 
for shafts of these magnitude for the bridges, most times a demonstration shaft is required anyway to demonstrate the means and methods are appropriate. If we're gonna do that, why not throw a couple extra hundred grand at the in, the, in the cells to do the test? So to me, it's, it's kind of a no brainer. It's not my money, I guess, so that's easier for me to say, but it sure seems like every time we've done it, not only the benefit of resistance factor, uh, but just demonstrating that lateral controls, it, there's a lot of optimization, and I think the costs are, I mean, it's, it's well worth it. Thanks, Great answer. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Thanks, everybody.